I'd like to start with a story. I'm looking at David. I have stood for Hollywell twice, uh, 2021, 2022. No, no, 2020, 21. 21, 22. 21, 22. We'll get there. And then I stood out. I, I stood out from all of this. And David called me last year, David Thomas, and said, Diane, I need to see you. I know you're committed. I know you're passionate. Why are you not coming? And I said, David, you know, there's too many inequities. I stand for the social justice agenda, as you were saying. Voice, participation, representation of communities, minoritized communities, racialized communities, less seen and less heard in spaces like this at local government level. And it goes on. And David said to me, David, you forgive me because I didn't ask your consent to share this story. <laughs> but I'm going to tell it like it is because I think it's really, no secrets, no secrets. I'm going to tell it like it is. David said to me, I, I'm tired of going to meetings and seeing only white faces. No offense to anyone here, but I think it's important that we speak these issues clearly, boldly, with clarity about why it's important that there is representation of those voices, those communities less seen and less heard. And I said to David, David, I've been sharing why I have become disenchanted, why I am tired of being the lone soldier in this field. And I've been reflecting often on that word recently because it's coming up a lot in circles that I'm in, be it academic circles where we're you know, reflecting on the current state of the world or social spaces. This, I don't usually use warfare language and terminology, but this lone soldier keeps coming back because when I'm on the ground with community-based leaders who are often the only black person in their particular field, be it health, be it education, we're all experiencing the same thing, fatigue, utter exhaustion. And so we're grateful for allyship. And this is what David offered. He offered firstly a listening ear. He said, I'm prepared to listen to you. And this is something that we're doing when we're on our action days. We have not many, there are not many doors to knock in Hollywell. I'm standing for Hollywell. For those of you who don't know, it's 98% students. It's Oxford University, essentially. And so this year, <clears throat> we've got an excellent campaign manager in place. We've had Great support. There's Elise there with a the beautiful furry coat. And this is, you know, I've had lots of support from Elise, from Craig, from a lot of people in this room over the years. And this year, David said, look, let me listen to you. Let me hear you. Tell me what you need. And part of what I said, I said many things. We had about three conversations, didn't we, David, until I said, yes, let's have tea. <laughs> um, and I shared with him things like, I'll just give you an example. When you are here representing those voices, you are also carrying your own trauma, your own lived experience of the very inequities that we are standing to change, to shift, to bring to light, to transform. You're carrying those yourself. And so what I was going through in reflection, this is a moment of vulnerability for me to be able to stand there and say, I'm going through my own trauma. Standing here evokes my own trauma about oppression, about white supremacy, about all the things that I stand for. But David said to me, okay, tell me what you need. And so one of the things I said I need was very, many of the things I said I need. He said, well, politics doesn't usually work like that. So um, you need a counselor. I said, yes, I need some trauma-informed counsel that can support me. So that when I'm on the street and I'm speaking to somebody, or I might experience somebody who, um, you know, where there's a microaggression, for example, that I have an independent source of support that is beyond my family or beyond my other activist friends and circles, because there are going to be other needs for candidates like me. And so he assured me that he try his best. I think he said the budget would be finished in four days or something. <laughs> But I came back and I'm here and I stand because I care. I really am committed. I really do want to, without more harm to myself, 
and I'm not saying that it has been harmful, but I have shared, as I've just said, that um, there are many invisible factors that need to be considered when you're looking at um, candidates from minority backgrounds, and I do that, say, in inverted commas. Yeah? So, I stand because I care. I stand because we are winning this year. Right, David? I'm not going to say that. <laughs> <laughs> I always say it's going well. It's going well. The campaign is going well. And we've done many innovative things. Anybody who knows me knows I'm an artist, knows I'm a creative, knows I always come with perhaps some, pe some people might say zany ideas. But the idea is that David said, look, let's just run a very traditional campaign. Leafleting at a certain time, action days, and that's what we've been doing. And the response has been great. Oh, yes, we've seen you in the pigeonhole. We've seen your newsletter. Students are mostly concerned. Trans rights, homelessness are the two things that are coming up most often. We've got a couple more, a couple more engagements um, planned. I did a Women's Day talk with the African Caribbean Society at Oxford University. We've been invited by the Climate Society. We're still going to organize what's going to happen there. And then the African Caribbean Society wants to do a special event to endorse this campaign when everybody's back um, for next term. So we're getting support through internal societies and the Oxford Green Student Society. Is that correct? Have I got that correct? Oxford Green, anyway. <laughs> the Greens inside the university. And so we also did an event there where we explored what belonging feels like. My work in the, in, the, in the world is about belonging. It's about social justice. It's about exploring how we can create the conditions where all can thrive. All can thrive, no matter your ethnic background. And this is why I want to stand, because I feel to complement all the work that Chris and others, Rosie, great to see you, have done, you know, all the councils that we already have in Cedar Oxford City Council, there's still more work to be done. And so I really look forward to being part of the group and uh, changing policies and the way in which Oxford, which, you know, is the UK's most wealth, second most wealthy city, um, one of the highest levels of diversity in terms of ethnic backgrounds, you know, the university has a lot to contribute to that. That, those those figures and also one of the most inequitable and so that is it i'm standing for race equity in the social justice agenda